I'm not going to say anymore because I don't like to say that. Um, I'm so good to see everybody here tonight. And I have to say that, um, well, let me say, I'm Stacy Hoagland. I've known him for actually longer than I thought. I thought that I knew him for about 13 years, but I have a son who has autism, he's 21. And it was probably about 17 or 18 years ago. I was at an Autism Society of America National Conference, and it's in a different location every summer, it's in a certain month of July. And I, my son was young, and I wandered into this training room because uh, it said transition. And I thought transition being preschool to kindergarten. And so I thought, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to learn about this transition because that's where I was in my own journey. And um, I walk in, and he's standing at the front of the room, he's getting ready, and he starts to introduce the topic. And I look on the screen, and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. This is, this is transition, you know, out of school. So I'm ready, I'm gathering my things and getting ready to go out the door. And the first thing that comes out of his mouth is, it's never too early to start working on transition. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay, back in my seat. And I sat down. And I not only was enthralled by all the information that he had to give, but I probably stayed another hour and a half afterwards talking to him. Because one of the beautiful things about Herm and y'all is that you know that he always has time. He always need time. He, um, any time I ever saw him standing with anybody who was asking him questions, he never rushed them away. He never said, I have to get to, I have to go do. He would make the moment to talk to you. And then, so I got to meet him there, and I kind of stayed in touch with him. And then the next thing I know, he's working at CARD in Miami, and he was starting their transition services down there. So we got going on that, and I, I saw him, because I'm an educational advocate, so I would see him every once in a while and different things. And then I get a call one day that says, guess what? I'm over at the Children's Services Council, and I want to put together this group of different agencies that uh, could benefit young people and adults with developmental disabilities, and uh, I want you to come check it out. So when I had gone to just observe, he had put together an amazing group of individuals that were very influential throughout Broward County that were coming together to talk about how can, really he held them to it, how can you guys all help us? How can we all work together for the young kids whose lives we're trying to impact? And he kept the group very focused on that. And um, it was interesting because after one of those meetings, and it might have been a couple years later, but I remember a few of us, Lou was sitting there with me, and uh, Martha Martinez, who was with APD, another amazing soul that we lost a couple years ago. And we were sitting around and we were talking about, what can we do? How can we help? What can we, how can we start to chip away? And, and he knew that you know I was advocating with the school system and trying to, you know, break their arm and trying to get to make some changes within the school system for, for kids. And Herm said to me, the problem is, is that you're gonna work so hard on that, but our adult system is like non-existent. So you work hard over here and you strong arm the school district to do things and they do it, and then what? Then the kids move on to what? And so as, as passionate as he was about children, he was about adults with developmental disabilities as well. Um, and so then he, when we were sitting around and, and we were talking about how there are some agencies out there that will tell people, oh, you're unemployable. So you're not gonna get a job, so basically just you know, get your SSI check and you got Medicaid and hope for the best. And that wasn't good enough for Herm. He, he's who I learned so much from. He was certainly my mentor with my own son. He made me a better parent. He made me a better advocate. He made me a better systems changer. So much of the stuff that I do every day is attributed to him and his influence on me. And he so vehemently believed that everybody could have a job. Everybody was employable. And sometimes it's a little tricky, but everybody has gifts to bring to the table. And so when we were talking about that, we said, oh, well, what are we gonna do? Because the adult system doesn't even exist. What are we gonna do? And so we started talking about putting together a training for people who receive the, young, the kids when they exit school. So even though Diane Braggett, she's with the Gold Coast Down Syndrome Group, and myself were the ones, because we're the moms who 
we were connected to two agencies that were able to do it. That project's been going on for 10 years, and it was really all about her. It was him who brought it up, him who shoved me down the road to make it happen. And like this past year, we, we, we have to we have to find a bigger place next year because we have hundreds of people coming. This year, the invitation was sent out once, and we, we, we packed out within 48 hours. Um, so that's the kind of um, change that he's made within the adult community because, um, and Herm oftentimes was one of the presenters to that, and he would share with them about how to um, look at the individual that they're representing differently with expectations and not thinking of what the person couldn't do. Um, so that was, you know, beyond amazing. And then I happened to, Lori Cabrero, whose letter was just written. I've known Lori, actually, my son, who's 21, and her daughter, who's 21, were actually in preschool together when they were three. So I've known Lori a long time. And she got me involved with the Unicorn Foundation. And I was sitting there one night for a meeting, and I knew what she was going through with trying to find middle school and then into a high school for her son. And we were sitting talking, and we were getting going on the conversation about the Unicorn Academy. And she said, what are we going to do about a headmaster? And I said, I'm just fine. <laughs> there was no doubt in my mind. And I said, I don't know if you can get him, but if you can get him, it's going to be amazing. And um, I, don't, well, I know we were looking at some slides before. And so if you guys put that on again, you'll see that when the, they first moved into the building, it was literally like a big empty room like this. There was no walls. There was no floor. There was no nothing. And everything you see there has to do with the design that Herm saw in his head. Um, yes, there was so, I mean, I know Sharon Alexander, I give Sharon so much credit for that school because um, not only did Herm probably have to look crazy from time to time, but you know, her board that she has to answer to and everything that had to go into the development of the school. But the kids who are there, it is life changing. It is promoting independence, the independent functioning, the life skills that they need, the job skills that, I mean, I'm an advocate in the school system, and I can tell you there is nothing like that school in the public school system. We actually had the superintendent of schools a year or two years ago come to visit. He brought his whole entourage, and he said to her, okay, how do we do it? How do we make this happen? I want it. I want it now. I want it like yesterday. And uh, so we started hashing out some of the shortfalls that the public system just has. It has, and there's some things that even the superintendent of schools is challenged to, to do anything about. But it was so great to be actually witnessing a superintendent of the sixth largest school district in the country say to Herm, I want what you're doing, because I've never seen anything like it before. Um, so I can go on for so many different stories about Herm. One of the ones that I love about him is that, and I, I mean, I remember when he told me, I was like, holy cow, is there anything you haven't done? But when, you know, he spoke <laughs> Navajo. Who speaks Navajo? <laughs> you know, when he told me he spoke Navajo, I was like, who, why? Why did you do that? And he told me about his military background, and you know, they, they learned that they talk to each other, nobody else would know who's Navajo. But that's what kind of person he was. Every time I spent any amount of time with him, I learned something new. I learned something new about what he experienced, what he'd done. And, and you know, the last couple of years when I, I would usually call him and say, oh, I need some help with something. We'd be talking about a project, and he'd say, well, as soon as I get back from China, <laughs> Singapore, uh, wherever, the list was endless. And I said, you know, <laughs> you influence people, you travel. So while, you know, I cannot overstress the sadness and how much I'm going to miss having him as a mentor. He lived a life that I would love to get to the end of mine and say it was like this. Because he has done amazing things that you guys will never, never be able to capture and quantify. And for that, 